Blog Talk Radio. Your journey begins right now. From the West Coast of British Columbia to you listening around the world and blasting out into the universe. Welcome to tonight's edition of Space Out Radio. Call us at 1-607-203-5344. Tweet us at Space Out Radio. Find Dave on Facebook at Space Out Radio or Skype us at Space Out Radio. Now, here's your host, Dave Scott. Good evening and welcome to Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, and thank you so much for tuning in to us on this Thursday night. Make that Wednesday morning, early Thursday night. Let's flip that around. Wednesday night, early Thursday morning. We're all tongue-tied to start off this show, but hey, sometimes it gets like that. Battling a little bit of a cold here in Uncle Jimbo's cabin as we've entered it, stoked up the fire, heated this place up, and now we are broadcasting to you live, L-I-V-E, live. Here at Space Out Radio, we are broadcasting seven days a week, your official one-stop shop when it comes to the supernatural, conspiratorial, paranormal, cryptozoological, and so much more. On Twitter, you can follow us at Space Out Radio. If you're a Facebook junkie, how about giving our page a like, Space Out Radio Show, and ask to join our private Space Out Radio group and our other group, Podcast Central. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott, S-O-R, and of course, you can now subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show, and our website is spacedoutradio.com. At this time, as we do every night, we'd like to send a shout out to our fans in the Space Out Radio chat room, along with Paranormal Into the Night and Paranormal Forum. If you go to our website, spacedoutradio.com, click on Cat's Corner. Psychic Catherine Fallman will answer one lucky listener submitted question per week. Tonight's show is brought to you by Rivulet Reiki and Readings, providing healings in person or at a distance. Space Out Radio listeners receive a 10% discount on pricing. Purpleplates.com help heal your body, mind, and soul. Drop into their site and heal yourself today. 80,000 people a month read the New Agora newspaper. Find out what's happening around the world regarding politics, health, supernatural, paranormal, and so much more. If you have an iPhone, download the Spirit Story Box. It only costs a buck. Spirit Story Box, the official ghost hunting app of Spaced Out Radio. Tonight, we step back into the woods of the weird, where we get back into the crypto world. Ronald Murphy is a monthly contributor to Spaced Out Radio, and he is a fantastic author as well, who delves into everything from the legends of fairies to dogman, as well as hauntings and demons. Ron's books can all be found on Amazon.com. We bring the man we've nicknamed the Crypto Guru on because he has this insatiable excitement when it comes to covering stories of the unknown. He's a true investigator where he does his homework. He's not some two-bit schmo who believes every story he hears that comes out of the eastern United States. No, he looks into it further. He wants the truth. He wants the real deal. For Ron, the details of the investigation are just as important as getting to know the people who have had the experience, for it's the people who make the story. But there's some serious questioning that has to go along, making sure that the story isn't just some tall tale of someone wanting their 15 minutes of fame. That's what he's good at. Ron specializes in the land of the Fey, which we'll talk about tonight. We're also going to get into Dogman, the Ohio Grassman, and we'll get into the people who are having these experiences as well. Ronald Murphy is coming into Space Out Radio Land now. Ron, always good to have you back for your monthly edition. Hello, my friend. How are you? I, I anticipate this time of the month uh, uh, constantly. I look forward to being on your show and having you know the great audience that you always attract. So I'm, I'm happy to be here, flattered to be here, as a matter of fact. I always love it when you're on, too, my friend, because we have such a good time, and I really don't think two hours goes by quicker than when you were on the air with us. It's always a blast. I agree, I agree. So let's get this party started, shall we? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, And and I'm going to apologize to you and the listening audience here because I am battling a little bit of a cough tonight, little uh, Spaced Out Radio. He has developed a horrible cough over the last couple of days, and I think his present to me has been uh, starting to get to me here, but that's okay. Uh, So I will manage through. Ron, what's it like 
being an investigative journalist, and pretty much that's what a writer is, is you're an investigative journalist who puts it onto paper and then publish it. Did you ever think that this is the path that you would take when you started writing or way before you even thought about writing books? You know, actually, it was not. Uh, I started out uh, very uh, mainstream. I, you know, I was writing a lot of short stories. I was writing a lot of poetry. Um, uh, and it was uh, just my, my overwhelming interest in the paranormal that actually led me down this path. And uh, I went to a conference, uh, the Butler Paranormal Conference, a few years ago. And I met some really great people that were involved with the uh, the Center for Cryptozoological Studies out of uh, uh, Beaver County, uh, Pennsylvania. And I thought, you know, these are the kind of people that I want to be around. They were not negative. They were very, very positive people. And I thought, you know, this is the kind of world that I think I could actually interact with. Um, so many people in this field uh, have a negativity with them because they do not want to share information. Uh, there's a lot of rock star mentalities in this field where people want to be the end all and be all. We have a lot of experts in the field of cryptozoology. Um, and we don't, there's a lot of people out there that do not want to have the spotlight taken from them. So it was my first introduction with uh, the Butler Paranormal Conference uh, just those few years ago that I decided that I want to be a writer. And um, as luck would have it, uh, I will actually be talking for the first time at the Butler Paranormal Conference this April. So you can see how quickly uh, uh, two years have went by. Um, but uh, it, it does have to deal with a lot of the people that you're involved with. I've worked with psychics in the past, some of them good, not some of them not so good. Uh, I've lost friends uh, doing this kind of research because this is part of the fringe world. Um, it's becoming more and more mainstream, but there is still a fringe element attached to it that some people do not want to be associated with. So I've lost friends doing this, and I've made friends far more very good friends doing it as well. So uh, I've been fortunate that I've been able to make um, some money doing this, but I'm even more fortunate because I've met some great friends and I've had fantastic experiences. And unless I was doing this kind of stuff, I would have never met you. And uh, I do uh, I count you as one of my friends. Well, thank you so much, and I count you a good friend, not only of this show, but of myself as well. I would love for you to express what you mean about ego in the field. We have a lot of listeners who love cryptozoology, but I don't really think they understand, including myself, what the ego is all about when it comes to this field. Well, excellent. Yeah, that, that, that's perfect. Um, I remember um, for the first time that I had what I believe was some sort of paranormal encounter. And if I could, this was um, back in about uh, 1996, 97. I just graduated from college, and I was in graduate school. And um, I was uh, it, I was living with my mother. Of course, you know, uh, graduate students are pretty poor. So I uh, finished up uh, my my uh, my undergraduate degree, and I moved back home to a, uh, attend a graduate school in a little my small town, my little hometown back there. And I and I, I moved in the home, but my mom happened to live very close to um, uh, some woods that uh, bordered on. Um, uh, conservancy land. So there's a, there's a large swath of woods there. Shortly after I moved back home, um, uh, there was uh, these whistles that you would hear at night, and the, the, these sounds I, I cannot explain even to this day. Um, so one day my brother and I thought, you know, it was every day, 3 o'clock in the morning, that this, this sound came almost like clockwork. Uh, and we decided that we would go out and investigate it. So he and I went out. Uh, we got close to where we we heard this uh, whistling going on, and whatever it was um, started to growl at us while it was still whistling at the same time. So that was my first encounter with the paranormal. So I decided that I would look it up online. Uh, and like I said, this is like 96, 97. I thought I would look it up online to see what kind of things I could find. And if you can believe it, there was only one Bigfoot website to my state. This this was all pretty brand new stuff. There was people doing investigations. They were few and far between. 
But, um, you know, this was very new whenever I started to begin my curiosity and my investigation into the world of cryptozoology. Now, that being said, everybody and his brother now are what they consider experts because they watched, you know, a season or two of Monster Quest on the History Channel or Ghost Hunters on the Travel Channel. They think that they know what they're doing because they have heard some terminology that they can throw around. Um, and people that have been doing this for a decade or two decades think that they are the pinnacle. Uh, these are the the investigators, capital T H E investigators. And I run into these people all the time. The only thing they're missing is sideburns and a cape. They're the Elvis Presleys of the uh, of the uh, crypto world, and you can see that they have little disciples that follow them around. They can do no wrong. However, these are the same people that are not going out in the woods and doing an investigations. These are the same people that are writing books simply by going to uh, public domain sites and um, copying and pasting uh, reports. You know, I've seen it done. You've seen it done. Um, you, you know, people are putting out books that are a hundred pages long, and they're calling them books. You know, I. I, I Try to give my 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 readers uh, something substantial. Uh, my books are, are are always going to be uh, you know the length that you would expect a a book to deal with the uh, the supernatural would be. Um, I try to look at it from all aspects, but I will tell you, um, people right now are a little bit leery about giving out reports because they're afraid about what kind of investigator is going to be looking into this. Um, it happens here in Pennsylvania all the time. I've heard it from other states. Uh, but, uh, yeah, th th there are people out there that do not want to help anybody else. They do not want to help any other groups. Uh, they want to keep all the information they get uh, as if it was very proprietary. Um, I believe in confidentiality in this field. It has to be adhered to because people aren't as a, a, you know as apt to come forward if you're going to give their name. Confidentiality is one thing. Proprietary information is something totally different. If we are going to be looked at from uh, from an angle of scientific scrutiny, then we must share information in order that we get a collective body of evidence. Uh, gathered. And I am all for sharing any kind of evidence. I talk to people. I go to conferences. I give out my email address because I definitely want to talk to people that are having these experiences. And if I can't give them a, an answer, I will I will refer them to somebody. I, and that's the way I think we have to be in this field. But right now, my friend, it, it, it is a sad thing to say because everybody is out there trying to get their own television show or trying to write a book, or trying to be the person in our geographic region, and uh, the, the waters are so muddied that real events, real cryptozoological events or paranormal events, are being swept under the rug because uh, people are more concerned about ego than evidence. And you know what, Ron? I, I totally agree with you, and I see it on the podcasting side where it seems like everyone and their dog has a podcast these days, and I've expressed my views many a times on this show in regards to that, that the amount of ego that goes around in these fields, whether it's paranormal or cryptozoological or even ufological, even though it doesn't seem to be as bad in that field, but it, it's tough when you're just trying to be a teammate and get answers and people are more worried about the publishing. They're more worried about the television show or getting on other radio shows like Coast to Coast AM or something along those lines. Because it seems like everybody has a pilot for a TV show these days. And the ego is swooning around that rather than worrying about what really brought you there, which is the research. Oh, and I have been on researches. I I've been on expeditions where people take camcorders along and they will, you know, say cut and go back and do a scene again uh, and make an investigation, almost a reality TV thing. And reality television, whenever people are watching this 
uh, on TV. And, and I have been involved in the making of uh, reality, reality TV, not as a subject, but I've been a, a, a bystander to watch a reality TV show being made. And the last thing that it is has any reality to it whatsoever. It's very scripted. It's very calculated. You have to understand, whatever you see on TV has to be funded. So there are producers out there that want to get back the most money on their investment. So what's going on is they're putting this out, they're packaging this as very, very real events. But in, in TV, by its very nature, cannot be genuine. It has to be scripted to some degree, or you know, nobody's going to sit there and watch a program where nothing happens. You know, we live in a very microwave society. We demand instant results. Uh, so whenever we sit down to watch a TV show about the paranormal that's an hour long, we expect to see results within that time period. And I've been on plenty of expeditions where absolutely nothing happens. But there are people out there that every time they go out in the woods, they have to bring back some kind of evidence because that's what's going to get them a, a show on, you know, um, Destination America or, you know, or, or on, you know, a Canadian broadcasting channel. They want to be famous. Um, and that's a sad, sad commentary. Um, I take nothing away from anybody that puts a lot of hard work into it and achieves fame in that way but there's a lot of people out there that are taking other people's work and stepping on them and claiming it as their own and that to me is you know reprehensible it's it's plagiarism at its very best and uh it's you know it, it's taking somebody's intellectual license and just you know making it their own and and that is a sad commentary on the field of of, of the paranormal researcher and if it can, continues to happen uh, it, this this will this 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 wave that we're riding right now uh, in popularity it will wane it will go down because people will be so um, uh, I, I guess inundated by the constant stream of reality uh, paranormal television and uh, and fake results that people are going to get sick of it and they're going to turn away from it and that's the last thing that I want to see happen. We are talking with author Ronald Murphy tonight on Space Out Radio. He is our resident crypto guru. You can find all of his books at Amazon.com. Now, Ron, I want to stick with this topic for a second because we're getting some reactions from our audience in regards to the ego in the field because I think we kind of touched on a sensitive topic there, which people love to talk about. And I for sure think that it needs to be talked about in regards to what is truly going on out there. So when you're seeing these investigations and you're seeing these people, and we're not going to name names tonight, but I think pretty much everybody knows who they are. Do you think anymore, whether it's paranormal, whether it's crypto, that anybody actually cares about finding what they should be looking for? Actually, it is almost, uh, it, it's analogous to, the pharmaceutical companies. If they find a cure for something, there's no more money in it. If they find any of these cryptids, any of them, and we're not talking about Bigfoot, we're talking about um, uh, uh, the, the Black Panthers that are said to roam parts of the United States and Canada. You know, if they would find something like that, their career is over. You know, it, it, so God forbid if, if a Sasquatch would be found, because what are they going to be looking for now? And it's also what these people don't understand is whenever one of these major cryptids are discovered, they it's going to be taken out of their hands. It's going to be appropriated by science. However, it can stay within the paranormal researchers' domain if we go about it scientifically. And a lot of my research involves um, extreme scientific analysis. Um, I deal, I'm a, I'm a, a, a Jungian psychologist uh, in regards to the way I approach all cryptid research, um, that I, th I believe in archetypes, so I'm looking at archetypes. So I'm not looking at these creatures first and foremost as flesh and blood. I'm looking at them as something that is part of the human psyche, and I want to find out why. And as I investigate a lot of these instances, it seems that these creatures are actual honest-to-goodness creatures. Some aren't, 
but some appears that they, they most certainly are. Um, and I want to be one of the researchers after the dust settles that I would still be um, uh, acclaimed is the wrong word, but how about regarded as a, a as uh, somebody that the scientific community would still want to work with? That I want to become a, uh, approach this with as much skepticism as necessary, but would have you know no closed mind in this either. That's a difficult road uh, road to hoe um, to be both um, skeptical and um, uh, very. Um, open-minded regarding uh, cryptozoology but yes getting back to your uh to your statement if uh if if something is found so many people will be lost losing their jobs because at that point it moves from these pseudo scientific shows on the animal planet to your pbs stations or to your you know your 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 mainstream stations so yes if something is uncovered if something is completely verifiably discovered then it is gone out of the paranormal researchers' hands, and it will be appropriated by the scientific community. So I see my job to be as scientific as possible because I want to be there in the end with the scientists. We're talking with author Ronald Murphy tonight on Spaced Out Radio. You can find all of his books at Amazon.com. And you know what, Ron? I, I love the fact that you take this as a good, honest approach, and that's the reason why I bring you on on a monthly basis, because there's no BS about you. There is, you know, just let's find out the facts. Let's get to the realm of the story rather than trying to figure out, you know, what television show or what publisher is out to get you, because eventually hard work is supposed to pay off. That being it's said, tough. Ron... You sit here and you write and you choose a topic. You're very well known on the East Coast regarding your work with fairies. Before you got started, did you really believe that fairies were real or did you think, lack of a pun or a better term here, that it was just a fairy tale? Exactly. And um, I first came to uh, my uh, research on fairies, not as a cryptozoological subject, but as an academic subject in graduate school. I was taking a course on um, uh, medieval England. Uh, as I, 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 get a, I guess I should point out that I was a, a history major in graduate school. So I uh, focused on the ancient to medieval uh, history. And I was taking a course on uh, medieval England. And uh, time and time again, I would start seeing these references to fairies. Even whenever you study King Arthur, uh, the famous Morgan Le Fay is, you know, Morgan the Fairy. I mean, we, we have this this continual line of uh, fairy belief uh, stretching back uh, from antiquity uh, up and through the uh, Middle Ages and into the Renaissance and even into the Enlightenment. Um, and if you really look into it, um, you know, there's some place in the world where the idea, the notion of fairy even though it might not be named fairy in that culture, it still certainly exists. And uh, whenever I first started to uh, approach it, um, <clears throat> I saw them as metaphors for the natural world. Um, I saw them as uh, as convenient convenient person uh, personifications of the other world, like the Green Man in um, in uh, uh, British folklore. But the more I'm looking into it, the more that I see that there is truth behind this, these legends. There is, um, you know, there is actual concrete um, reasoning behind why certain cultures um, uh, had uh, the fairy as an archetypal character within their within their society. <laughs> Ron, when you look at the point of the Fae, a lot of people, and I, I want to kind of stay away from the history of them here because people are having experiences with them. People are having them at their doors, in their rooms. I mean, I have sent you the video, and you have reviewed the video in your professional opinion of my daughter filming a little fairy in her room. And, you know, for people who don't know that, my daughter filmed, you know how teenagers are, where they, they videotape absolutely everything that they do. And they were lip syncing and dancing to some music, her and her friend. And the clip is only about six seconds long. But in behind her, you could see something move very weird. And you have to realize, when this video was filmed, it was about minus 22 outside. So there's no bugs flying around. And Ron, right. you looked you looked at that video. I would love it if you could break that down for us. 
Yeah, you know, and and basically it's the way that you had talked about it. It was two people. It, it was it was something uh, very um, inconspicuous. I mean, there there were there was there was uh, you know two young people having fun, dancing around, and but but, but the thing that I want to point out about this is that as seemingly unnatural as a fairy encounter would be. Whenever you see it on film, it looks amazingly natural. It looks like it is supposed to be there. You know, even though it takes you off guard instantly, whenever you see it, after you watch it several times, it looks like you know it is a part of this world that's going on. Why the attraction is there, I am not sure. My experiences that I've that, that I have investigated, it does seem that there is an energy put out by you know uh, you know adolescent girls that attracts a lot of different paranormal activities. Uh, it might be an energy that you know they can actually uh, uh, feed upon to manifest, or it might just be some curiosity that's going on. But um, there was no kind of fear going on. There was no kind of worry that was happening. It seemed as if this video captured a very natural object moving through your house. I mean, that, that, that's the way it appeared. And, and, and I've watched many, many fairy videos. Most of them, the vast majority of them, 90% of them, I can rule out as nothing more than insect activity. But whenever you're dealing with harsh winters, and I have seen fairy pictures uh, in you know the depths of winter whenever there was snow flying, there's no other way to describe it. I, I have I have seen things picked up on 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 um, on uh, trail cams that you know you can see musculature, uh, you can see uh, wing patterns. Now, I, I must point out we're not talking about Tinker Bells from Disney here. We're talking about things that are are are, are anthrop, you know, anthrop, anthropomorphic. I mean, there, there's a human shape to them. But they are, you know, the only way to describe them is the way uh, the great researcher in the Renaissance described them, Paracelsus. And he described them as elements. And that, that's the way I see them. These are elements, natural occurring beings within, the, the, within reality. You know, he broke it down to fire, water, you know, air, land, and each of these elements have um, have uh, you know certain uh, personas attached to them. Uh, so you have fairies that live in different realms with, around the world. And I think what you caught there was an elemental simply making its way through your house because it was a, it was attracted to the, the the energy that was being produced there. And like I said, I've seen this plenty of times. I've seen it on trail cams, um, and I've talked to people. We've talked to people on your show uh, that have uh, uh, witnessed uh, uh, fairies. And uh, I am believing it more and more every day that our world is, um, you know, what we see is only part of the reality that's going on around us, that this world is very, very layered. There's dimension upon dimension around us. And this isn't quasi-scientific. You know, science has proven that there is more to our reality that we can see. Uh, the whole idea of chaos theory, the whole idea of, of quarks, the whole idea of, of, of black matter. There's things going on out there that we simply cannot sense. But that doesn't mean they're not real. And I think every now and then, this other reality will blend in with ours and you, my friend, were lucky enough to videotape another reality intersecting with ours. We are talking with Ronald Murphy tonight on Space Out Radio. He's the Space Out Radio crypto guru. As we are going to head into our first break of the night, more fairy talk, and then we're going to get into Dogman in the second half hour with Ronald Murphy. You are listening to Space Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. We'll be right back. This is Patrick Webster Small, and I'm going to bring you the Webster Phenomena right here on Spaced Out Radio, Monday night at 8 p.m. Pacific Time. Every week, I'm going to bring you the freshest information on the globe. I'm bringing you guys the truth, extraterrestrials in the sky, prophecy, chemtrails, rainbow spot, the seventh angel, biblical skies, ancient gods. 
ghost, spirit, see it, hear it. So let's do this every Monday night. I'll see you back here at 8 p.m. Pacific time. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the place have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit and... Expect a miracle. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Did you know that Spaced Out Radio is live seven days a week? This is Jim Tyson, host of Spaced Out Weekend. You can listen to my show, Spaced Out Weekend, every Saturday and Sunday night starting at 1 a.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Pacific. On Spaced Out Weekend, we like to delve into the paranormal, even the newest technologies that have enhanced modern-day ghost hunting. And sometimes, we'll get a little creative and dabble into the crypto world, UFOs, and much, much more. So tune in at www.spacedoutradio.com on the weekends and listen to me, Jim Tyson, on Spaced Out Weekend. Hi there, this is Jolene with Rivulet Reiki and Reading, and I want you to relax. Let me help you chill out and get in touch with your body, mind, and soul. In this busy world, sometimes we need to let go, and this is where I can help. Visit my website, rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivuletrnr.com. Or my Facebook page, Rivulet R&R, to set up an appointment for relaxation, Reiki, or readings, no matter where you are. Spaced Out Radio listeners will also receive 10% off their first visit. It's time for you to make time for you. The Spaced Out Radio Network can be found at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is Dave Scott. Here, you can join the latest on our weekly shows and news from around the world involving UFOs, cover-ups, cryptids, ghosts, and more. Read articles from our very talented staff and check out our weekly tarot card reading from psychic Catherine. You can also sign up for free on our forum and tell us about your experiences. Spacedoutradio.com. Always live, always interactive. Ready to find out what's flying up in the sky? Me too. Hi there, this is Rich Giordano. Please join me every Sunday night at 7 for the AZ UFO Show. It's a fast and compelling two-hour show on UFOs, extraterrestrials, conspiracy theories, and much more. Every week we will have great guests and great topics to try and answer the ultimate question, are we alone in this universe or not? So tune in to the AZ UFO Show with me, Rich Giordano, right here on the Spaced Out Radio Network at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to connect with Dave and his guests? Learn more at spacedoutradio.com for the latest news, features, photos, and articles. Spacedoutradio.com is where you can stay up to date on what's happening around the world and up in the stars. And now, back to Dave Scott. Welcome back for the second half hour of Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. Tomorrow night on the show, Sandy Mack will join us. She is a healer. Not just an ordinary healer. She goes into past life regression to heal your problems today. It's going to be an interesting show. I highly recommend you check us out tomorrow night on Spaced Out Radio. Hey, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. On Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R. Facebook us at Spaced Out Radio Show. Give our page a like, and you can ask to join our podcast group, Paranormal Paranormal. Make that podcast central, as well as you can join Spaced Out Radio. On YouTube, you can follow us and give our subscription to Spaced Out Radio Show. We're putting our archives on there as we speak. And, of course, our website is spacedoutradio.com. Tonight, we are talking with the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, as he is one of 
the best out there, at least in my opinion. I will brag about him because I can. And Ron's books can be found at Amazon.com. I highly suggest you check them out. Ron, we were talking about fairies to end the first half hour, and I want to continue with that because there is – a real debate out there with people who follow the cryptid worlds and the elemental worlds that fairies can either be good little creatures like we think of Tinkerbell or they can be real, real, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sinister in a way. What's right, your opinion right. of that? Um, I like to use the term indifferent. Um, I think that whenever there's any kind of um, fairy encounters that are that go against uh, what one would expect, you're ba- basically dealing with something that wasn't supposed to be messed with to begin with. Uh, so I think that that's the thing. I think that we have to have a healthy relationship with uh, with the fairies. And that's the way people from the very beginning of time saw it. Um, let's not step on their toes. Um, if we go into their domain, which is basically the uncultivated, uh, we must respect that they're there. Um, many cultures around the world believe in giving some sort of token of generosity, whether leaving out a cup of milk or some honey. Um, uh, some parts of the world will leave out bread. That um, you know, we we are aware that there's something else out there. And uh, we don't want to offend it in any way, um, so let's keep our distances. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the trouble starts, that people will go into places and just automatically set up shop, if you will. Um, places like Iceland are very um, – uh, they're very um, knowledgeable about the idea of the fairy realm. And they will actually halt highway progress if they believe that they're going to be going into t- uh, territories of trolls or territories of elves, um, which also have the same connotation of the fairy. They belong to this goblin universe, uh, this this world where the other kin uh, live. Um, so uh, we in the United States, um, and, and you know, for most parts of Canada, you know. Uh, we we live in very urban environments. Uh, we have tamed the wild areas. But as part of my research, I go into areas that were once very, very um, occupied by human civilization. And for one reason or another, such as floods or uh, economic downturns or you know natural disasters, Almost all remnants of humanity has been erased, and the um, the forest and the natural world has encroached, and it has now become places that are wild again. And I find out that these places are the ones where people are re- reporting fairy activity, as if the guardians of nature, as if the very citizens of the world that is green has come back and reclaimed their territory. And to this very day, um, you know, since I've been researching this for uh, going on 20 years now, uh, to this very day, I still um, have uh, deferential treatment uh, to nature um, I, because I do think it is imbued with all kinds of different intelligences that we kind of have uh, ideas about, but some intelligences we have no idea about whatsoever. So I'm sure that I leave little green spaces. You know, I'm sure that I leave some places untouched um, because I believe that that's the way we are supposed to interact with the world. Um, you know, we're not supposed to be dominant, supposed to be living in concert with it. And uh, like I said, I am very respectful of all, thing nat- all things natural. And uh, in my research, uh, whenever the human footprints have been erased, uh, the footprints that are now in their place belong to the fairies. We are talking with author Ronald Murphy tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Amazon.com is where you can find all of his books. I highly suggest you check out The Crypto Guru and his books from there. Now, a lot of people, like we were talking about my daughter who actually filmed a fairy, and I trust your perspective on that because you're the expert, not me. And when you call it a fairy, I'm going to call it a fairy. A lot of people now are setting up natural gardens to try and attract fairies back to the area. Do you think this is happening? 
and are people actually seeing what they are seeing or do you still think there's a figment of the imagination out there that people are hopeful and it's a good story to tell the neighbors or the or the guests who visit their home well see this is a great topic and this is another thing that I've been researching extensively now for probably the last five years. So we call things figments of the, of the imagination. That's fine. Um, but what my research is coming to uh, realize is that these things that we call figments of the imagination may actually be implantations of an intelligence that is interacting with our world. Now, that seems a little confusing, I guess, but I will explain it to you. Um, in the Middle Ages, uh, fairies uh, were known to have something that was called glamour. We still use that word today. You know, We have glamour magazines. It's because a woman will change her appearance through makeup and fashion. But that, 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 that word, that term is actually very old, and it refers to a fairy being able to mask itself so that it appears differently than what it actually is, so it acts as a sort of a disguise. So whenever I talk to people and they say themselves that they think it might be a figment of their imagination, I'm starting to believe that this is an implantation into their mind uh, psychically by beings that are capable of working on that particular frequency that the mind works on. And whenever I go into, think, into research of, uh, of Bigfoot and uh, other cryptids, you know, I'm starting to believe that these creatures are able to influence the way that we think. That sounds far-fetched, but I will tell you this, there is precedence in science involving this. Um, we, we know that alligators and crocodiles are capable of producing infrasound. And infrasound is a frequency that we could not hear with a human ear, but it affects us. Uh, it actually, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, it reverberates within us, and it kind of throws off our our balance, our, our psychic balance, if you will. Um, so it, we know that it happens in the world of the reptiles. So now you want to see if there's any precedent for it in the mammalian world. And there most certainly is. Um, elephants use infrasound um, to affect their environment. Uh, there was a, re a study done by uh, uh, MSNBC on infrasound. And the researchers, the scientific researchers said that infrasound is capable of producing, quote, unquote, paranormal feelings. There, so there's a, res there's a feeling that there's something out of the ordinary, something not quite normal going on whenever infrasound is, uh, is, is in effect. So why can creatures that we call fairies or creatures that we call Bigfoot, which I am beginning to believe is more a part of the fairy realm than a part of the flesh and blood uh, terrestrial realm, why can't these creatures use something that is a biologically proven mechanism within our world to um, help, uh, you know, uh, keep them elusive. This might be part of their elusivity, that they're able to produce a sound that affects us uh, to believe uh, that we're, that, you know, it's all in our mind. It's a figment of, the, of our imagination. Researchers are not looking into this right now. Um, and I, and I feel um, uh, quite confident uh, in my research that I would be able to present this uh, if, it, if it did indeed require any kind of uh, a scientific scrutiny. Um, because what it seems to me is witnesses seeing something that they call a Bigfoot and automatically, you know, they say that it disappears. Um, why can't uh, a very naturally occurring uh, element of infrasound be used to somehow cloak them, to somehow make you not see them. Uh, if this would be a great evolutionary mechanism to keep an animal uh, safe at a distance without having any kind of contact with somebody um, uh, trespassing to in their territory. Um, and that is the research that I'm continuing on right now. 
I'm starting to break it down from the way that um, uh, history has viewed the way the mind works. Uh, Rene Descartes, um, the, the great uh, French uh, mathematician, uh, he had this notion of something called the Cartesian theater of the mind, that the mind really, in essence, is a place where images and stimuluses are processed to produce a reality that is unique to every single one of us. Um, it's based upon, you know, our knowledge of the world, um, our education. It's based upon, you know, even the language that we that we have. That all these um, images that we get, all the stimuli that we get from the outside world, is processed so we can subjectively look at different things in the world from a very personal point of view. It's my belief that cryptids and fairies are able to manipulate uh, this, uh, this private world of ours the way that we see them through, uh, through very natural means of, of, of infrasound or something along that line that is able to affect the way the human perceives his reality. Ron, do you then recommend that people take the time to set up these fairy gardens and bring them nearer to their home? Because if we're still having the jury out in regards to whether fairies are good or bad, we could be opening up a little bit of a dangerous window, could we not? Especially if they are tricksters? Yeah, well, that, that is very true. So what I would tell you, and what I tell people that have, have talked to me uh, regarding this, I think that it does come down to intent. Um, if you're a hunter or if you've known any hunters, um, you know that the natural world reacts differently if you go out there with a gun. You know, I, I've seen it happen you know, in my own life, you know, I, 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 I don't call myself a hunter, but I have hunted in the past. And I know that, you know, a leisurely walk to the woods is going to produce a far different atmosphere around you than if you go walking through the woods with a gun or with a dog. Or if you take a child with you, the natural world responds differently to your intentions. And I am of the mind that if somebody has pure intentions that purity is attracted to this. Uh, and I believe that if you have fairy gardens in your yard, that, you know, you, and, and, and your intentions are, are right, that, you know, a positivity is going to be attracted to the positive, and it's going to linger there because you're nurturing it. Now, on the flip side of that, if you are trying to, to get them into your yard to take pictures of them and to use them, it's going to be just like a human being. I mean, this is not going so far afield that you think that there cannot be any kind of repercussions. If you use somebody long enough for your own personal gain, there's going to be some sort of rebellion attached to it. So, you know, we're dealing with intelligent entities here, whatever you want to call them, you know, whether you call them fairies or elementals or interdimensional beings. Uh, we're dealing with an intelligence that is capable of interacting with humanity. And, you know, I, I have a bumper sticker that says, don't piss off the fairies. And, and that's the way I look at it. You know, uh, you know if, if you are planting a, a fairy garden because you want to have uh, nice little um, uh, nature spirits around you, I say go ahead. If you're planting a fairy garden because you want to take pictures of them and put them on um, uh, Monster Quest, I say be very careful because I think as soon as your pictures are going to be turned into uh, to money, I think that's when you're going to start having things in your house breaking and, you know, poltergeist activities because a lot of my research has shown that um, certain poltergeist activities can be very, very related to uh, what we call fairy activities. So, yeah, you know, it's going to be in your uh, intentions. Uh, and um, after a while, uh, they're going to know why you've planted the fairy gardens. I'm not going to lie. Mrs. Spaced Out Radio will not allow me to tear up a natural part of our garden in the backyard. Uh, she she will not like allow a, me to do it. Yep. She sounds like a fantastic woman. I'll tell you what. Um, a lot of people are creating green spaces right now. And I love that idea. I truly do. Um, I think that fairies and Bigfoot 
could be the poster children for the uh, the environment and these ecological movements. I'm not sure why uh, more people have not, um, you know, uh, put them on their banners and raised them on their flags because I think that it makes, uh, you know, great sense. These are the personifications of the wild areas. We are, you know, we are tearing up everything. Um, I work with one very, very gifted um, a psychic and researcher that always like to walk up around this one uh, particular park. Uh, she lives uh, in the city of Pittsburgh, and she used to walk around this one particular park because she loved to hear the psychic sounds of the fairies singing in the park. And one day, before she even got to the park, she felt this terrible sense of remorse, and she got closer to where she uh, heard the songs before and heard the singing before. And now she heard terrible lamenting and wailing and crying. And she walked, and she saw that there was a bulldozer there, and it tore up the park. And I think that these kind of things do happen. Um, But uh, the research that I've done in areas that have become... uh, very forested again. The legends that were that there previously, the legends of Bigfoot, the legends of ghost lights, which are a lot of people see as manifestations of fairy activity. These have returned, and the reason they've returned is because it's part of the natural world, and for for this part of the natural world to um, to exist, it needs some place to thrive, and we're taking that away from them. But, you know, that also being said now, I will have to point out this, too. For, in order for infrasound to work, you have to have a correlating evolutionary track with these other... Uh, for instance, um, the reason why um, skunk spray works on us is because we had an evolutionary connection with a skunk. You know, the, the reason why um, snake venom works is because it, you know, it, it is designed to attack and kill mammals, okay? So these creatures out there know us for, you know, thousands of years, if not, you know, hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years. They know us because the the mechanisms that they use interact with us. So we have, we have a shared evolutionary line with them, and we have to keep that in mind. Um, and um, instead of um, instead of uh, working against them, we should work more and more with them. So, whenever you see uh, people like uh, Jane Goodall out in the woods and how calm she is approaching the uh, the great apes, that's almost the way we should start approaching the Bigfoot. You know, we should we should approach them as something part of nature. You know, don't go out there <coughs> with with guns. And trail cameras and everything. Let's go out there, stand in the woods, accept that there's things out there in the woods that we know nothing about, that we cannot grasp, and and let that positive uh, sense kind of flow through the trees and wander about in the moss and let it blow around like the leaves that are picked up by the breeze. Let your spirit go out there into the woods. And let's see what's attracted to that. Some of the best research that I've done and some of the best evidence that I've gathered is just by going out in the woods and let it start coming to me. Ron, I want to get to the Bigfoot part because I've never really heard you say out of all the times that we have been on this show together that you believe that Bigfoot is part of the fairy clan rather than a hominid. And I want to get to that. But first, I want to get to gnomes. Because a lot of people who are seeing fairies are now seeing an increase in gnomes running around. And I'm going to be honest with you. Even the ceramic ones scare the living daylights <laughs> out of me. I can't, I can't stand gnomes. And a, a little story from a number of years ago. When my first wife and I separated, I had a basement suite uh, near where my children were. And... Um, So in my daughter's room, there was a window into the backyard, and my landlords at the time actually had garden gnomes. And at least two, three times a week, my daughter would hear knocking at her window. And she would swear every time it was the garden gnomes, because she even said one time she even saw the shadow of one get up and and run away after after it tapped on the window. Now, I'm going back way even before I had my own personal experiences. This is going back now probably seven, 
almost eight years ago. Do you see a lot of that happening or hear a lot of reports when it comes to garden gnomes like that? Uh, you know what? Uh, it's it's odd, but I have been getting a lot of gnome, uh, uh, a lot of gnome reports. Uh, it, it's been going on. Um, not so much the garden gnomes. Now I have garden gnomes in my yard, so if you do ever happen to come back to Western Pennsylvania, I will have to remove them. But um, it's odd uh, that people do either have a complete like or a dislike for garden gnomes. Uh, they were placed there uh, because of their um, uh, belief that they would help gardens grow. I mean, that, that is, that is the, the purpose for them to be in your yard. Um, but people are witnessing uh, things running through the woods, traveling at an unbelievable amount of uh, speed, uh, covering like 40 feet in a second or something like that. And um, whenever you see a still picture of them, it appears that they have some sort of headgear on. Sometimes it's the typical uh, red tall cap. Sometimes it looks something like a, a helmet. But um, it is interesting that people are seeing them. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I'm finding a little bit of a cold myself. Um, but whenever you look at the word um, gnome, it probably comes from uh, a word that means earth dweller. So, again, our, our good buddy Paracelsus in the 16th century uh, classified these as earth elementals, that these are the things that live in the earth. These have this attachment. Um, in, in western Pennsylvania, uh, of course, Stephen King uh, made this, uh, uh, you know, uh, immortalized the idea in his book. But we have something called Tommy Knockers, which is a which is a subterranean creature that uh, many miners have reported hearing the knocks um, because uh, creatures that live in the ground, you know, you automatically assume that they're down there doing something. So people, you know, naturally believe that they're miners, what have you. But you know, we have we have legends of to Tommy Knockers. We have a great uh, gnome mythology going on in Iceland. Um, and there's little people reports in Hawaii. There's little people reports in um, Canada, um, throughout um, throughout the United States. Um, and uh, so there is something definitely going on there. But, uh, yeah, I, I get known reports a, a good bit of the time. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and actually this Sunday, my good friend Brian Seach, uh, for the Center of Cryptozoological Studies, uh, he's going to actually be doing uh, an in-depth interview with people that have uh, a first-hand witness of gnomes, and I will actually be uh, on a conference call with them on Sunday. So, oh, very nice. Yes, yeah, so the next time I, ha I will be on the, the show with you, we'll be able to talk about that. Ron, I'm going to get you to hold on here. We are going to take our break at the top of the hour. Looks like you could use some water. I could use yes. some water as we're both <laughs> battling colds here. We're going to talk more garden gnomes. We're going to talk Bigfoot being from the fairy realm, and we're going to get into Dogman with Ronald Murphy, the crypto guru here on Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. We'll be right back after this break. The Phoenix Lights, Roswell, secret military aircraft, flying saucers. Let's check out the sky together. Hi, this is Rich Giordano, host of the AZ UFO Show right here on the Spaced Out Radio Network. Every Sunday night at 7, we hit the airwaves to talk about the phenomenon of unidentified flying objects and more. We want to hear your stories. Maybe you've seen what many others have seen. Only one way to find out, the AZ UFO Show on Sunday nights on the Spaced Out Radio Network on spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is James Tyson, host of Spaced Out Weekends. And I know you're enjoying tonight's show with Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio. I just wanted to remind you that Spaced Out Radio continues on the weekends with me. On Spaced Out Weekend, we hit the airwaves at www.spacedoutradio.com starting at 10 p.m. Pacific, 1 a.m. Eastern. We have great guests with interesting chats regarding all things paranormal, supernatural, cryptozoological, and much, much more. So tune in to Spaced Out Weekend and give us a listen. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. 
With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. Need a break but don't have the time? Tired of life's running around? Hi, this is Jolene from Revela- Relaxation and Readings. Let me help you in your time of need. From Reiki to Realm Readings, I can help provide you therapy for your mind, body, and soul. Check out my website at rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivuletrnr. And if you're a listener of Spaced Out Radio, receive 10% off your first session. Rivulet Relaxation and Readings. And don't forget to give my Facebook page a like. It's time for you to make some important time for you. The Spaced Out Radio Network can be found at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is Dave Scott. Here you can join the latest on our weekly shows and news from around the world involving UFOs, cover-ups, cryptids, ghosts, and more. Read articles from our very talented staff and check out our weekly tarot card reading from psychic Catherine. You can also sign up for free on our forum and tell us about your experiences. SpacedOutRadio.com. Always live, always interactive. The Webster Phenomena airs on Spaced Out Radio on Monday night at 8 p.m. Pacific Time. I'm your host, Patrick Webster Small, and I discovered extraterrestrials in the atmosphere, which led me to more discoveries developing the Webster Phenomena, which is the occurrence of extraterrestrials throughout nature. I will explain the Webster Phenomena and all my recent discoveries every Monday night at 8 p.m. Pacific Time, right here on Spaced Out Radio. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Want to call in to Spaced Out Radio? You can. 1-607-203-5344. You can tweet us at Spaced Out Radio or send us a message on Facebook at Spaced Out Radio. And now, back to the show, here's Dave Scott. Welcome back to Spaced Out Radio. Hour number two is underway. And welcome back to Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Tomorrow night on the show, Sandy Mack will join us. We're going to talk healing, but not just regular healing. We're talking going into past life regression to heal what is happening today with your body. Very interesting topic. I'm really looking forward to this one. I hope you'll be with us to enjoy it as well. If you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show, as well as Spaced Out Radio Group and Podcast Central. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott SOR, our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to it. It's Spaced Out Radio Show. And, of course, our website is spacedoutradio.com. Tonight we are talking crypto with the crypto guru, author Ronald Murphy. You can find all of his books on Amazon.com. And, Ron, thank you so much for joining us again tonight. It's always a pleasure to have you on for your monthly appearance. Hey, sir. I'm flattered to be here. Every time I come on, thank you very much. I appreciate it. We were talking fairies and gnomes right beforehand. With gnomes, I don't know why I get freaked out about these, and I know many people do. And reading Paranormal Into the Night as they chat about this show tonight, there are many people in there who have actually had experiences with garden gnomes. I know you're part of that group, too. I highly suggest you read it right after. And if any of our listeners are listening, and if you're on Facebook, you can join Paranormal Into the Night or Paranormal Forum, two groups that follow us outside of the Space Out Radio chat room. Now, one thing about gnomes is where do they come from? Because when I think of gnomes, they scare me, as I've said many a times already. But I also get a good laugh because I'm a big fan of the television show South Park. And they did a <laughs> show on, on gnomes where, you know, the gnomes were the ones taking all the all of the underwear and the left socks and the Tupperware containers and leaving the lids. 
So that's, right. that's what I think. That's what I think of a gnome when when I have something go missing. Are gnomes getting a bad rap here, or are they just little creatures running around? Because on all due seriousness, Ron, I have heard First Nation legends up here where there is little people communities, but the First Nations really do not like talking about them. Exactly, exactly. And that is the thing. Um, whenever you look at the history of the gnome, uh, the first time that it's called the gnome is the 16th century. But the ideas of the kind of um, uh, habitation where the gnomes are said to exist goes back into antiquity. Um, so gnomes could be the satyrs. They could have been the elves, you know. They could even have been called the, the the goblins, the brownies, what have you. But these are creatures that inhabit the dark forests, you know. Um, now there is also an association with them that they might be capable of hoarding treasure, that they might steal from humanity, um, and there is this um, notion that they can be harmful to humans. And usually whenever there's a, a legend surrounding something that is harmful to humans, it's because at one time they were harmful to humans. Um, so right now I think that they've been relegated to the very, very wild spots. However, as I've said before, um, places very near popular populated cities like Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania – uh, people are getting what looks like, to me, um, the stereotypical gnome on a trail cam. Uh, now, that's not to say that they are not able to manipulate their their uh, physical form to appear the way we want them to appear, by the way we think that they should appear. But um, whatever the case may be, there is what appears to be manifestations of your typical gnome the kind of garden gnome that you would see outside, uh, people are seeing these things actually running around. Should but we be worried? Well, uh, well um, uh, so far I have not had any uh, reports of, uh, of an attack or anything like that. Um, and gnomes, are, you know, they, they put garden gnomes in, in gardens because gnomes have a, uh, have a, um, a deep... Uh, affinity towards uh, the earth, you know, like, like we had talked before break, you know, that's even where their name uh, originates from, you know, earth dweller, uh, probably that's where it originates from, but um, I don't think there should be a true fear there, uh, but again, we're, we're, we're dealing with, 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 with creatures that, you know, like human beings, there's good ones and there's bad ones. And sometimes you might just catch one off on a bad day. Uh, but I think it's it's good to always have a healthy respect for anything that we don't quite know for certain what they are. Uh, but I would not be afraid by any stretch of imagination. It would be something, I, I mean, I would much rather have a gnome living near me than something like a mothman or a lizard man. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I think as long as we have a healthy, healthy respect for anything, that they are going to sense that respect and not really mess with us. At least I hope so. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too, indeed. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there was a great, um, uh, my kids loved to watch, and they loved to read Goosebumps, and there was uh, a great uh, a book, I believe it was called Night of the Garden Gnome, and uh, that was just one of those freaky ones where the garden gnomes came to life and started to attack the kids in the house and everything, and, you know, these are great things, these are great fodder for, for uh, books. Um, I love the idea. Even J.R.R. Tolkien loved the idea of gnomes. Uh, but, uh, yeah, as far as hearing any kind of really bad thing happening, no. Now, you know, there's reports throughout the world and throughout antiquity where fairies have done very, very bad things. But as far as the gnome goes, I think you'll be okay, just as long as you're not too freaked out about them, you know, pushing a wheelbarrow through your yard at 3 o'clock in the morning. I think you'll be okay. Ron, I want to get into Bigfoot here, but someone in pay, pay, uh, in the paranormal end of the night chat room made a really interesting comment about feral children. We're now hearing yeah. 
this as being the next hot button topic in the crypto world about feral children. Have you investigated that at all, or is that something that is interesting you? Uh, (laughs) Actually, it it is. I I just finished up uh, uh, research for a chapter on my book. I will be having a book coming out called um, uh, uh, Dogman, Tracking the Werewolf Through History. And that will actually be premiering at the Butler Paranormal Conference uh, whenever I will be there uh, towards the end of April. So that book will be available at that conference for the first time. And I am looking at the Dogman legend and the legend and the ideas of lycanthropy uh, from the time uh, whenever humans first became humans up into the modern era. Now, what's going on that I have found is there's places like um, uh, uh, Arcadia in, um, in Greece where there was cult of the werewolf. Now, that's for lack of a better term. Werewolf, of course, is uh, you know is, is taken from the German and it's anglicized and everything. But if you would have went back into the Greek antiquity uh, and you said you know werewolf, they would have had creatures analogous to this, something able to shape shift. Um, and what my research is showing, and what I, what, what what I am actually pretty well happy with right now is that uh there was a a a mountain there uh a very remote area arcadia was a very backwater area of um of uh of greece uh and there was human sacrifices that happened uh in arcadia uh Pisanias, the great travel writer of the uh, of uh, of the of the classical age of Greece, wrote that he even had seen the remains of uh, human sacrifice victims. But as the story goes, um, you know they would take uh, uh, adolescent children up there and choose one and sacrifice them to uh, the the werewolf. Uh, what I'm coming to think is going on is places like um, Sparta uh, and even even places as uh, erudite as Athens would take a child that they did not want, whether they believed it had a physical uh, deformity or not, and simply expose them to the elements. Um, exposure was a way, a psychological way, that a parent could abandon a child in the woods and leave it up to the gods to decide what would happen. They didn't kill their child. There was no infanticide involved here. They simply left it out there, and the gods may do to it what it wants to do with it. Now, uh, whenever we think of uh, of, uh, Oedipus, uh, of the famous play Oedipus Rex, Oedipus actually means swollen foot because uh, part of his tradition is that his parents wanted him to be um, to be killed out there, so they took a, a, a spike and drove it through his foot so it wouldn't be able to crawl away, and the wild animals would come and get it. But um, exposure was something that was extremely common in the ancient world, uh, and it is my belief, it is my belief that, um, that this, this occurred enough times that there could almost be a feral tribe of children out there. And I'm not saying that they're raised by wolves, although Romulus and Remus show that that was at least an idea within the Roman mind, that kids could be raised by wolves. But um, it usually appears that there is a farmer or a shepherd or some person that would take these, these abandoned children in and raise them up if not, you know, fully as one of their own, but at least feed them and clothe them and things like that. So it's my belief that in these regions where the children were abandoned, that a small percentage may have lived through their exposure and became feral children, and they in turn would have uh, developed into uh, an idea of of the werewolf, of the man wolf, especially if they were walking around on all fours. Uh, they they appeared to be uh, human, yeah, but they also appeared to be animal. 
they, if there was a group of them, they may have even uh, formed a, a, a society that was very pack-like, and they would have traveled around in packs. Uh, they would have been, um, you know, foraging for food. They would have been scavengers. Uh, and I think that a lot of our notions of the werewolf comes from very, very natural occurring things like feral children. And, um, it, it, you know, and reports have happened about children being raised by troops of, of, of monkeys in India. And, of course, we do have famous wolf children. And, uh, and I think that this has happened, uh, and especially when, in cultures that surrounded uh, uh, the uh, – or at least – accepted the idea that it was okay to take your child, leave it out in the woods, and whatever happened to it happened to it. I think that these cultures that have feral children in them uh, would develop into werewolf legends, would develop into wild man legends. And I think that Mm -hmm. feral children do easily explain a lot of uh, cryptid myths from antiquity. Fantastic question, and that's the reason I love to come on your show. You have some of the most intelligent listeners that I've ever come across in my entire life. Well, thank you so much. I do appreciate that, and I know they appreciate hearing the compliments as well. Ronald Murphy is our guest tonight, the crypto guru, making his monthly Space Out Radio appearance. You can find all his books at Amazon.com. When it comes to these feral children, and I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't hear about these and didn't learn about these children until about four hours ago when I was oh, right, starting to do right. my research for the show. And one of the things that, that mystifies me about them is with these children, are they mystical? Like I can see parents, you know, with cultures like in India where it's very unpopular and religious to have a, a, a female. A lot of cultures, they need that boy, you know, to carry on the family name and the family tradition. And girls are tossed to the wayside, as sad as that may be. I mean, it's just horrific that in today's day and age, there are countries that that is happening. But when it comes to these feral children, I'm still not convinced that they are human, first of all, in relative aspects. But number two, if they are of a mystical type creature, would they stay young forever or would they grow up into feral adults? Oh, right. Well, sure. I mean, in, in India, we definitely have the idea of feral adults. And um, there have been reports in places like uh, in Russia with their idea of the Almasty, their, their version of Bigfoot, where one of these wild women were, were captured and, if you can believe it, uh, mated with and produced offspring. Now, there has been DNA uh, uh, analysis on the remains of these uh, of these beings, if you will, and they've proven to be totally human. Um, so we're also wondering why, in my research, I'm also wondering why um, certain children would have been um, uh, abandoned. Uh, and it may have to do with some sort of deformity. Now, what happens if that deformity happened to be something like hypertrichosis, which is this unbelievable amount of fur, uh, of hair that, that develops, a very, very real condition. Um, as my research was, um, was uh, developing, I found out that there have been reports that hypertrichosis could be um, uh, – uh, passed on, if you will, through sexual contact. Uh, so whenever you think of uh, the werewolf biting somebody uh, and passing on its werewolfism to an un- un- unsuspecting victim, uh, is, is this a metaphor for the uh, for the passing on of something like hypertrichosis? So in my uh, my research, um, I don't think it's going too far out on the limb to think that there was, uh, you know, in certain areas uh, like Greece, especially in these mountainous areas where you wouldn't be getting a great influx of of genetic diversity, it's very possible that if there's a trait there like hypertrichosis uh, was able to manifest itself, that before long it would start coming out uh, uh, pretty regularly in the children, and these children might have been 
um, exposed, you know, left out into the woods to, to die at the hands of the gods. Now, if certain of these children would have lived uh, and uh, if they would have been seen, they would have been nothing more than wolf people. Now, of course, like I said, uh, this this is this is very very new research for me, so I'm not going to be uh, uh, you know talking as if I'm an expert at it as of yet. But uh, it, and it's going to be ongoing research. This is something that I'm really really uh, uh, intrigued about. <coughs> Excuse me, but um, but uh, I do think that um, the idea of hypertrichosis in regards to feral children is a very real possibility to explain uh, at least certain werewolf cults in ancient Greece. But uh, yes, there would be if if the timing was right, it, uh, these children would at least go to adolescence. Let's switch it over to Bigfoot here as you grab yourself a drink because I'm going to need yes, one yes, pretty quick you. here. Uh, we are talking with author Ronald Murphy tonight, the crypto guru of Spaced Out Radio, making his monthly appearance. And, Ron, one of the things that I want to talk about is you having the thought that Bigfoot comes from the fairyland instead of being a naturalized hominid to this planet. Why do you think that? Um because of what people are, 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 are talking about now. Uh, somebody uh, actually in Ohio uh, stated that they were uh, investigating, um, investigating Bigfoot, and um, they turned around, saw the creature there, and immediately they, they, they hit the ground and passed out, uh, not out of shock, but something you know, overtook them, something, uh, something psychologically overtook them and overwhelmed them. Also getting reports of people shooting at Bigfoot, and they disappear before their eyes. Now, it's much easier for me to believe that something is disappearing because it wants you to believe that it's disappearing than it is actually disappearing because these creatures, that if they they do exist, they're going to have to follow some of the rules of physics, you know, because you know we're dealing with 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 um, with uh, you know mathematics at this point. You know, we're dealing with science at this point. So if these creatures are out there, then they have to follow some sort of rules by you know by the way the world works. So I find it much easier to believe that something is wanting you to make make you believe that it's disappearing rather than actually disappearing. Or people are going through the woods and they're following footprints, and all, all of a sudden the footprints disappear. Now, it, see, that sounds unbelievable to me. Now, of course, I'm keeping an open mind, but um, there's so many ideas that I, I see creeping up in the idea of Bigfoot that is synonymous with the realm of the fairy as well. Also, in regarding to these red glowing eyes that is continually being reported with uh, with Bigfoot, um, no mammal out there uh, produces. Um, well, let, let's put it this way: no ape out there produces um, eye shine. You know, that's not a human trait. That's not an ape trait. Uh, it, it requires a certain part of the eye. So. What would have happened to have to happen if you know if Bigfoot is a is a is an uh, a, a humanoid creature of some kind, a hominid, that it's going to have to go on a different evolutionary track, and it's going to have to produce something in its eye that is not seen anywhere else in the hominid world. Okay. That being said, uh, we're still getting ideas of red eye shine. This is also synonymous to the fairy realm. This, is, this has been reported since the Middle Ages of, of creatures in the woods with red glowing eyes because red is scary to us. You know, there, there's animals out there in the woods that have, you know, red coloration because it's a warning. You know, stay away from me. Um, if you see an insect that's red or if you see a snake that has red, it usually means, you know, this is a warning sign, stay away. So people are seeing these Bigfoot creatures that have red glowing eyes, but this is also something that has been reported in the fairy world. Also, wood knocking. A lot of people, especially places like Germany, uh, would report um, uh, hearing wood knocking, and they put that down to a fairy, appropriately enough, called a knocker. 
Um, this is the same thing that we're reporting or we're getting reports out regarding with Bigfoot, too. You know, the, these knocking behaviors. So what it seems to me as I'm doing my research more and more, that there is this overlap between what we call the Bigfoot and what we call the fairy realm. Bigfoot is a creature of the natural world. It exists within the confines of the woods. Um, like I said before at the very uh, onset of the show, I am also a follower of the discipline of structuralism, this one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one correspondence, this almost binary idea that if something is uh, appearing as an archetype as cultured, we have to have an archetype as something that is uncultured as well, too. So whenever we look at something like the Epic of Gilgamesh from the very beginning, we have Gilgamesh, which is the, the archetype for civilization, and we have Enkidu, which is a hair-covered bipedal creature, which is the archetype of the uncivilized world. But in all you know, intents and purposes, it is a Bigfoot creature that's being described there. Same way with Beowulf as opposed to Grundle. Now let's go now to our modern world. We have Bigfoot and we have, you know, the, the, the world of Walmart. Two very, very different things. But if you take that one-on-one -on -one correspondence back to the very, very beginning, we're looking at the world of the human, of the human and the world of the wild man, the, the non-human, the, 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 the realm of the, the nature spirit. And these nature spirits are the fairies. They're the, the elements of the woods. Uh, Paracelsus called them the sylphs. Uh, and uh, it, 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 just, it just seems to me that there is too many one-on-one um, uh, -on -one correspondence. There's too many binary um, uh, uh, occurrences that it seems like, you know, mathematically it seems to be a one-on-one -on -one correspondence that Bigfoot is equaling uh, uh, something of the fairy realm. Ron, we're going to step out for our final break of the night. Give your voice a break here. We are talking with Ronald Murphy, our resident crypto guru. A couple more questions on Bigfoot coming around the corner, as well as we're going to finish off strong talking about Dogman. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. We'll be right back. Want to find out what's coming up on the Spaced Out Radio Network? Go to spacedoutradio.com where you can find our daily list of shows and guests appearing throughout the week. Want to tell us your story? Be sure to sign up for the Spaced Out Forum for free. Maybe you have a psychic question. Drop in and say hi to Catherine in Cat's Corner. Spacedoutradio.com, your 24-hour source for UFOs, ghosts, conspiracies, and more. Check it out today. Are you one of many who's had a UFO or ET experience? Listen up. The AZ UFO Show is on every Sunday night at 7 on the Spaced Out Radio Network. We talk about UFO sightings across the globe, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, and more with me, Rich Giordano. I want you to know what's going on in the skies above you, so tune in to the AZ UFO Show on Spaced Out Radio Network on spacedoutradio.com right before Spaced Out Weekend. Our show is literally out of this world. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Brand new discovery beats NASA. This is Patrick Webster Small bringing you the Webster Phenomena every Monday night at 8 p.m. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to talk about amazing stuff. Have amazing guests. That's all there is, man. You know the rest. as ET up in the sky. I'm going to tell you which way and why. 
And we're going to have a little combo about these ETs in the sky. We're going to chill. This is Patrick Webster Small, and I'll be seeing you every Monday night at 8 p.m. Pacific Time. Write it down on Spaced Out Radio. Is the 24-hour world starting to wear you down? Let me, from Rivulet Reiki and Ratings, lend you a hand. Hi, this is Jolene. And if you're in need of Reiki or a realm rating, come to my website, rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivulet R&R, and let us help you out. At Rivulet, I specialize in healing your body, mind, and soul, no matter where you are. And be sure to check out the Rivulet R&R Facebook page for your best deals. Remember, it's time for you to make some time for you. Hi there, this is Jim Tyson, host of Spaced Out Weekend. When you've had a busy week and you're just wanting to chill out and relax, how about listening into my show? That's right, Spaced Out Weekend. I focus on the paranormal, the arcane, I even dip into the techie side of things, and much, much more. And I would love for you to come in and check it out. Remember, Spaced Out Radio goes seven days a week. Dave Scott, Monday through Friday, and me, Jim Tyson, rolling through the weekends. I look forward to having you stop by for a listen every Saturday and Sunday night, 1 a.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Pacific, only on Spaced Out Radio. Miss most of tonight's show? Don't worry, you didn't miss a thing. You can head to our website, where you can download the podcast at spacedoutradio.com. Now, back to tonight's show. Here's Dave Scott. Welcome back for the final half hour of Space Out Radio tonight as we're rounding third. We're heading for home. Love my baseball terms. Baseball season. You can feel it in the air. New York Yankees all the way. At least that's my opinion. Hey, tomorrow night on the show, we got an interesting topic. We're talking healing with Sandy Mack. Not ordinary healing, but actually past life regression therapy healing. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. We've got a great example for you coming up on the show involving my booking coordinator, Corey. And it's an amazing, amazing story. Sandy Mack tomorrow night. Hey, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Space Out Radio. You can give our Facebook page a like, Space Out Radio Show, and join our two groups, Space Out Radio and Podcast Central. On Instagram, you can follow me at Dave Scott SOR and our YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to is Space Out Radio Show. Of course, our website is spacedoutradio.com. Ronald Murphy, the crypto guru, is on for his final segment here with us tonight. He makes his monthly appearance, and once again, time has blown by, Ron. I hate when this happens, my friend. I'll tell you what, it seems like we just started talking about this. I went out to get a drink of water, and I see that we have like 28 minutes left. I I cannot believe how quickly this went, but yeah, I'll tell you what, I'm having a great great deal of fun here and i've been looking over some of the questions that your uh that these guests have and you know these guys are amazing again i i got to applaud the the people that you get attached to you my friend well thank you so much and you know what we got a great and intelligent group of audience members i want to ask you one question about bigfoot here because I am a true believer that Bigfoot is either a shapeshifter or interdimensional. Would that fall under the fairy realm in your opinion? Oh, absolutely, yes. Especially whenever you say anything regarding interdimensional. Absolutely. Um, and, And that is the thing. How else are we going to explain something that is able to go from one state of being to the other? Um, and that you know that is the whole idea behind why Paracelsus uh, in the in the uh, in the 16th century had to delineate between the different kind of elements is because he was trying to you know produce this alchemy this way to take one sub- substance and make it into something else and that's basically what's going with 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 Bigfoot and fairies isn't it there's some sort of physical alchemy going on it's going from one state of being to another and in the uh the mind of the renaissance that these creatures were were ways of personifying what was going on and and how to make it uh um scientifically uh acceptable uh to with the, the kind of work that they were doing so yes i do believe that bigfoot is a member of the of the fairy realm of the goblin universe because of the way he interacts with our physical world but yes whenever you said about interdimensional for over 15 years i was a firm believer that bigfoot was a completely terrestrial being now 
Another thing that I, I must point out, though, too, that doesn't mean that he's not a physical being. It's not to say that he is not, you know, a completely corporeal being in his own dimension. You know, and it, he just kind of every now and then the, the veil thins and it goes from one state of being into another. He very met what well may be a flesh and blood being in his dimension. He has just found a way uh, to go from one state of being to another and, you know, come into our world from time to time. Let's switch gears here. Let's go over to Dogman. You're sure. currently ri- you're writing a new book about Dogman. Dogman seems to be very popular right now. What's your book about that will be released here probably within a month or two? Yeah, it, well, it, it's it's actually called Dogman: Tracking the Werewolf Through History, and um, it is just an approach where I'm starting back with the very first um, ideas, the very first. Uh, conceptions of what it means to transform from a human into an animal. Uh, And then I I started to look at some other things, uh, some of the topics that we actually dealt with before, the idea of hellhounds, the idea of creatures that are in animal form but have uh, human-like intelligences attached to them. And these are some of the great great, uh, new kind of cryptids that are out there that have yet to make the headlines but are still so incredibly interesting. When it comes to sightings, we hear of a lot of sightings around Wisconsin, Michigan area, heading into Ohio. What do you think it is? Okay, um, I think that there is a few things uh, going on. Um, one thing that you have to look out, look look at, is that they seem to be referenced to areas of graveyards. Um, I, I don't know if you have ever heard about this or any of your guests have heard about this, but you know people have seen dogman creatures digging in in Indian mounds put up by the mound building cultures like the OD, uh, the Adena or the uh, Hopewell culture you know so you have this connection with with dogman in relation to graveyards i talked to one person that had witnessed a dogman being in upstate new york at an indian reservation in a in a very modern cemetery they seem to be protective spirits but that being said Whenever you look back into history, um, one of the first ostensibly dogman figures you have in history is uh, the figure of Anubis in the Egyptian pantheon. Uh, and Anubis is intrinsically involved with, uh, with burials. Uh, and it seems to me that this attachment with, with the dogman, this archetype of the dogman around places where the dead are, um, there is something to that connection. Um, is it part of the collective unconscious that, you know, uh, dog cr- creatures, you know, whether they would be the dire wolf or the cave hyena from the Pleistocene that is believed to no longer be with us, that they actually, um, s- you know, scavenge the bodies that we buried, very easy, you know, pickings, very easy food sources. And this has kind of stayed with us to the present, that it's been passed on in our our cultural DNA, if you will. And these ideas have have, have just come to the surface in this kind of folklore that deals with dogmen around graveyards. Or, Or are we seeing very real creatures that are, um, you know, totems to, and protective spirits of Indian reservations, Indian sites, First Nation um, sites, are they the spirits of Indians, the Sioux Indians, the Cherokee, all have these notions of shape-shifting. Are these the spirits of shape-shifting shamans? Um, I don't know what's going on. You know, that was the purpose of the book. And to tell you the truth, uh, the conclusion of the book is still in a question mark. I don't know what's going on. There's so many different things going on out there in the world of the dog man. It's really hard to put your finger on it. And I think that that's what makes it such a highly desirable cryptid to study. 
Are you seeing more and more sightings pop up with Dogman, considering that it is kind of the flavor du jour right now of the cryptid world? People have been knowing for 40, 50 years about Bigfoot, if not longer, well, pretty much since the Patterson-Gimlin film. But as we switch over to Dogman, it seems more people are starting to experience the sightings with Dogman. Right. Now, see, we have to look at this, this from two different uh, angles. Are people seeing the dog man because it's now becoming something in vogue, and therefore, you know, it's playing with their imagination? Uh, and or, or are they actually seeing it because these creatures are being forced out of their natural habitat more and more? You know, that it, it's a double-edged sword here. We have to be very careful as researchers about what is going on. Um, I first came into contact with the idea of the dog man whenever I was on a Bigfoot investigation uh, back in 1999. Um, a, a very elderly gentleman uh, who was still very, uh, uh, he had a spring in his step, but he had witnessed uh, a Bigfoot around um, while he was out fishing one night, and he wanted to prove its existence up until the day that he died. His name was Sam Sherry. Um, and I was uh, fortunate enough to go out with him uh, a few years before he passed away, and he had these elaborate little traps set up, trying to get hair evidence, trying to get blood evidence, so he would put an apple up in a tree and have um, a barbed wire wrapped around the tree, hoping that the creature would run up, rub up against it, and we'd get some sort of tangible, conclusive evidence that his sighting was genuine, you know. So he w we were out in the woods one time, and he told me, there are two different types of Bigfoot out in the woods. One is that big, lumbering giant, the very benign creature. The stereotypical creature from the Patterson-Gimlin film would probably be closest to what he was describing to me. You know, these, the vegetarian uh, Bigfoot. Uh, and then he looked at me, still a, a twinkle in his eyes. He said to me, he said, but you know what? I've seen another type of Bigfoot out there as well. It's, it's smaller. It's thinner. It has a, a, a face that comes out almost into a muzzle. And now remember, we're out in the middle of the woods whenever he's telling me this. And whenever he, he told me the final uh, sentence, uh, I was about ready to run out of the woods and back to the car. He said, and they hunt in packs. This was the first time I ever had the idea of the dogman, the first time I ever came in to uh, the idea of the dogman. It wasn't even called the dogman. He was calling it a different type of Bigfoot, a very gracile type of, of creature that hunted in packs, and ate flesh, by the way. <clears throat> and that from from that time on, I've always had this interest in a creature that hunts in packs that people are seeing. Um, one, uh, it, it's very popular here in western Pennsylvania during deer hunting season that people take spotlights out into the woods and they spot for deer looking for, um, you know, to see what kind of deer are out there uh, and where some good uh, hunting spots are going to be for the upcoming season. Uh, so there were some people out, out in the woods spotting. And they came across a cornfield, and they described seeing something that looked like a very, very large dog uh, sitting there in the field um, overlooking the road. Um, and But it, it wasn't a dog. It, it had the shape of a dog, but its, its legs and hind legs were not hind legs. It looked more like human legs and human arms. And... Uh, and it was frightening to me whenever they were saying this because the the behavior that they described is very typical of, you know, uh, an animal because we get a lot of road kills in western Pennsylvania, a lot of deers dying. And if you would think of an opportunistic predator waiting by a road in case, you know, a car hits a deer, which happens all the time, that it seemed like the behavior that they were describing was very, very um, plausible. But the animal that they were describing was terrifying. You know, the, the idea of um, a, a wolf or a creature in the shape of a man 
is frightening to us because what we assume is that creature has the intelligence of a man. And that's what we have a hard time dealing with, that there's something out there with an intelligence that's able to strategize that might be, you know, possibly we might be it's 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 prey subject at some time that's a very very scary thing for the human mind to grasp how often are these sightings coming ron are they coming throughout the year or is it more so when people are outside exploring whether they're hunting whether they're fishing atving motorcycling 4 by 4 well that's a good question it depends upon what part of the country you're looking at. Um, If you take the entire North America as a whole, these sightings are literally coming in every day. People are seeing them in the snow. People are seeing them in the summertime. People are seeing them in the night. People are seeing them in the daytime. They're seeing them in in, in swamplands in Florida and in you know in in, in the, the the vast wildernesses of northern Canada. They seem to be everywhere, you know. And um, but there's a lot of hoaxers out there too. I have to point out. And uh, that's rather unfortunate. But anytime anything gets very big, people are trying to capitalize on it and make money on it. So, of course, there's going to be uh, uh, people hoaxing things out there. But uh, it's just one of those things. I mean, there are reports coming in every day, uh, and it's up to a good researcher to, to scrutinize which ones are uh, uh, legitimate and which ones are people jumping onto the bandwagon or uh, misidentifications and such. But, uh, I, you know... It seems to me that the people that I've talked to, uh, you know, 80% of the reports that they are giving me are very sincere, and it's of something that I cannot explain from a scientific point of view. There's something strange going on out there, and that's how I conclude my book as well, too. Um, uh, archetypes, you know, if we do look at archetypes, and we do look at, you know, the notion of feral children, uh, you know, Archetypes do not leave footprints in the woods. You know that's that's the bottom line. I mean, I can be as skeptical as as I can be uh, regarding these subjects, uh, and talk about you know structuralism and talk about uh, the collective unconscious. But the collective unconscious is not leaving footprints in the woods. Something is going on out there. People are seeing things. And and that is what I'm trying to get uh, to the bottom of in, in my research. When's the last sighting that you investigated or heard about that you uh, uh, really took part in? Uh, well, actually, the group that I belong to, the uh, uh, the crypto, uh, Center for Cryptozoological Studies, uh, just uh, uh, went to up uh, to Mercer County, I do believe that it was, up in uh, the northern section of Pennsylvania, up near Lake Erie, uh, just a couple weeks ago. I mean, so th- these kind of things are being are are, are being uh, you know seen a, a lot and around very populated areas. Now, if I may, and I know that we don't have much time left, but I will tell you the one investigation that I did go on that um, you know it came about that that I did have an experience. One gentleman um, uh, kept on coming into a local store that was owned by a psychic that I am uh, that, uh, that I used to work with uh, uh, pretty closely with, and um, he would go into the store and he uh, well to give you a little bit of information uh, he would go in there with his girlfriend. Uh, this was an online dating situation. He was from out of state. He came here to meet his uh, his this this woman, and they 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 had a relationship, and he, he moved in with her and all that good stuff. But anyways, the woman would visit this little this little uh, new age shop to buy her incense, and she would drag her internet boyfriend along with her. So he was, she would bring him along, and he would stand in the corner not say anything. Well, here after a few weeks, uh, he started to come in by himself without his girlfriend. And he would, you know, not buy anything, not talk, basically just go in there and kind of loiter and walk around. Uh, But then after a while, he seemed to become habituated to the place, and he started to talk to to the owner of the establishment. He found out that she, you know, dealt with the paranormal and dealt with psych, you know, into psychic investigations and things. And so he opened up to her, and one day he came in and he said, that uh, he was a werewolf. He told her that he was a werewolf, and uh, and she said that she was taken aback by it. But you know, kept on talking to him, and to to get you know give you the Cliff Notes version of it, he claimed that his father was um, uh, uh, a werewolf as well. It was passed down through the DNA from father to son. 
And uh, and uh, when his father would change, whenever he knew that a change was coming, he would be locked down in the basement, chained down in the basement, actually. And the mother would take her son and leave the house because the father would want to hurt the child. Now, the girlfriend of this gentleman, uh, who claimed that he was a werewolf, also had a young daughter. And he started to tell uh, the psychic that he was very afraid that he was going to hurt the daughter. Now, you know, from from a scientific perspective, from a psychological perspective, he might be projecting some very strange urges onto a child, you know, and, and so psychologically he might be calling himself a werewolf because he has these these desires that are very animalistic, and that's his way of dealing with things. But he was so upset by these urges that he was transforming, and he was going to harm the daughter by, you know, wanting to attack her as a predator would attack her, that he said that he was going to have to leave so he would do no damage to the child. So, a week went by. He never came back in, and uh, the, the the girlfriend came back in one time with her daughter, and uh, the owner, the psychic, said, "Where is your boyfriend?" She said, "I haven't seen him. He took he he took off. You know, he's gone." Well, here about two weeks later, the man finally comes back into the shop. She said that he physically he looked a little bit different. His eyebrows were a little bit more bushy. His face uh, was a little bit more angular and everything. But he said that he went to this area, uh, well well out of town, away from uh, human uh, uh, humanity, if you will, into a flood control area where uh, the Army of Corps of Engineers will flood this area. So nothing is there. There's no houses around for miles and miles. And he went down there and he transformed into uh, a wolf. And while he was there, he came upon a she-wolf, and they, they quote-unquote, ran together, had some sort of sexual connotation to it or what have you. But it was such an intriguing story to me that I decided to go down there and investigate. And while I was down there, um, uh, we had very strange light phenomena going on, too. Uh, There's a lot of what I would deem fairy activity going on in this area. But... um, as our research was was continuing into the night, something was following us very, very closely at, at the wood's edge. Um, as we got closer to investigating what was going on, the thing began to growl at us. Now, I was with uh, with another researcher. And we did not see the thing, but talking about the idea of of infrasound and the implantation of images, the images that we both got within our mind was something quadruped, something that had teeth, um, and something that was going to do us harm. There was malice involved. We both got the exact same image of what it was without physically seeing it. So, you know, was it a dogman? Was it one of the, these 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 creatures that are down there, um, you know, uh, transforming and running far away from the the peering eyes of civilization? I do not know. But in my in my investigative research, my one encounter with the dogman, what I consider the dogman, was one of the most uh, uh, terrifying encounters that I've ever had. And whatever the creature was out in those woods did not want us to be there, and it was able to show itself to us without our our physical eyes uh, uh, landing upon it. So do you then think that Dogman has the same capabilities of Bigfoot as being from the fairy realm and possibly able to shapeshift, telepathically communicate, or become interdimensional? Um, I think in some instances it seems that way, but there's also a lycanthropic type of uh, element involved as well, too. So I, I don't know what's going on. This is one of those kind of creatures that simply cannot... Uh, be um, pigeonholed into a catalog. I don't know what's going on there. I mean, there are, are people that are seeing it as you know something that is is a pure werewolf, almost out of you know out of the movies. You know, something that's able to to transform. You know, uh, uh, so I don't know what's going on. 
I, I can just tell you what experiences that I've had and the research that I have done and the researchers that I've spoke with and the eyewitnesses that I've spoke with. Um, it seems that there's a couple of different things going on out there. It seems that one time, one instance, these are flesh and blood animals, some sort of uh, a wolf-like cryptid, if you will. Uh, another time, it does seem like there is an element to the fairy realm, an interdimensionality to it, and and as strange as this might sound, it does seem like there are people out there that are capable of shape shifting physically, corporally into an animal. I mean, I, I know that, that sounds strange, and I, 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 but you know, looking back into um, into the Middle Ages. Uh, uh, well, actually, from Greece on until about the 1830s, lycanthropy was a uh, mental condition. It was not a description of a physical trait. Now, later on, it did develop into the idea that you were able to transform um, uh, physically into an animal. But at, at the very beginning, it was a mental condition. But we do have some interesting things about how to discern if a person is a werewolf. There was an early belief that um, that a werewolf was always hair covered. The hair just grew inward. And um, to, to figure out if it was a werewolf, you could cut the skin open and see if there was hair growing inside of it. And that's where we get the word turncoat from, that, that, uh, that these creatures are capable of turning its skin inside out, and that's how it manifests itself as an animal. So, I mean, even whenever this was considered a mental, a mental condition, there was still physical ways to discern if it was a werewolf. So it always had this element attached to it that there was a, a way for a man to transform into an animal, and that is something very, very frightening. We uh, <coughs> excuse. Me. We have uh, two minutes left with you, Ron, and you know I do want you to get have some time to promote your books. But in your mind, then, is Dogman spreading out across North America, much like it is with Bigfoot, and maybe overtaking some of those Bigfoot territories? Yeah, well, you know that that. That would make a great novel, actually. I, I'm sure the Sci-Fi Network is in the works. You know, a big man, a Bigfoot versus Dogman would be an awesome movie. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it seems like. Um, I mean, there might be a misidentification too between the two uh, species as well. If they are both, you know, if they bo both do exist, it's very possible that there's a misidentification between the Bigfoot and the Dogman. But um, uh, it does seem like there is going to be some sort of territorialism that's going to be occurring because people are starting to see uh, uh, Dogman in very, very uh, uh, dense situations where uh, Bigfoot at once, you know, reportedly called home. So I think time will only tell uh, what the future holds. But, uh, yes, uh, as, as far as my books, I do have a novelization out. It's almost an allegory of the Dogman legend called The Pack. It's uh, it's the middle of a three-part series. The uh, first part of the series should be coming out in about a year, and uh, the uh, third part, the final of the trilogy, should be coming out in about 18 months. But you can buy The Pack now, and that uh, involves uh, werewolves in suburbia, the idea of the Dogman in suburbia. And I do have my own... Um, uh, fictitious take on uh, the Dogman legend, but um, I also uh, talk about the Dogman in my book, The Unexplained uh, Chestnut Ridge, which I deal with uh, as a researcher in western Pennsylvania, but I do trace the uh, history, however briefly, of the Dogman throughout the ages in that book as well. Um, and uh, and, I, and I, like I said, I, I do have other uh, novels out there that deal with the paranormal and such, but uh, I have a, 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 a research book out on mermaids coming out in about the next 30 days as well, too. So I have a lot awesome. of things happening, my friend. Yes. Much love to you, my friend. Thank you so much for being on Spaced Out Radio tonight. It's always a pleasure to have you on. I cannot wait to do this again next month. I'm looking forward to it, my friend. And you know what? I will quickly say this. Next month, we're on March 17th. I look forward to a great talk about leprechauns for St. Patrick's Day, and we'll go from there. We will talk about fairies in the British Isles. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. 
Do you have a topic or guest you'd like to hear on Spaced Out Radio? Email us, dave at spacedoutradio.com. Send us a quick message on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio or a message on our Facebook page, Spaced Out Radio. Once again, here's Dave Scott. Thanks to Ronald Murphy. You can find the Crypto Gurus books all over Amazon.com. Always a pleasure. He'll be back on the air with us March 17th. Tomorrow night on the show, Sandy Mack. We're going into past life regression healing. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, too. i got to learn this. This seems really cool. Hey, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, you can follow me at Dave Scott SOR. Check out our new YouTube channel, and that is Spaced Out Radio Show. You can subscribe to that. We are prepping to move over to Spreaker from Blog Talk Radio. We're working on it, trying to get over there ASAP. It's a phone issue right now. That's the problem. Hey, we'll talk to you in exactly 22 hours because I will be back in the hot seat, and then we only got two days left in this week. It'll be fun. We'll talk to you very, very soon. Good night.